Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Um, I've really enjoyed the first two talks. I hope today is not this, this one is not going to be too much of a letdown. It is before lunch, so just you know, just hold on for the last push. So I'm a developmental psychologist, and today what I'm going to be talking about is investigating cultural transmission uh, with children. Now I've got a slightly different talk that I've prepared to Nick's talk because I kind of very much come from a sort of methodological point of view, and what I wanted to do was to talk about the kind of questions that I'm interested in and then present a number of studies which I've undertaken to, to address those questions with a, uh, with a view that you could potentially, if you want to, go away and, and use some of the sorts of methods, which is why my subtitle of my talk is because I'm a psychologist and I'm working with kids, when we're doing these experiments, it's not like doing it with undergraduates. You have to have many hands and be more in more places than one. You have to make sure the kids who are waiting to participate are safe. You have to make sure that they're not doing anything they shouldn't be doing outside of the room, as well as trying to control what's happening within the room. It's just a bit of a nightmare. So I, I really love what I do, but I am putting that out there, that this, this, this will all look really easy, Actually, in practicality, it's actually really, really quite complex. Um, so I'm interested in cultural transmission. I'm interested in, I work with children, I'm interested in how they acquire their culture, how culture is transmitted across groups, and also how culture changes and potentially evolves over those groups. And I, I'm interested in what questions, who questions, how questions, and when questions. So I'm interested in what it is um, about a piece of information, whether it's a behaviour that we're observing or a verbal piece of information, what it is about that piece of information, elements of that, that piece of information that get transmitted. Now, we touched a little bit, because Nick touched on, I think we, we touched on it earlier on, about our brain does do some kind of parsing. We are, we are inundated with information all the time. And even when we're looking at one piece of information, there's a lot of detail within that. And what we're doing as, as humans is thinking all the time about which of these pieces of information, subsets of this information, we are going to concentrate on, and which of them we're going to take away, and how we're, we're encoding that within our own previous history. So I'm interested in what elements of a very complex piece of information um, are you then going to extract and then potentially reproduce or use in the future. And, I, and I've done this with Jamie Tarani. I know we were talking, somebody was mentioning Jamie Tarani earlier on, um, and I've been looking at in terms of text-based urban legends, these legends that have been transmitted over hundreds of thousands of years, what is it about urban legends and the content within them that mean that they then get um, um, transmitted relatively faithfully over a, a significant number of generations. But I'm not going to be talking about that today, but I just want to tell you if you do want to talk about that, I'm happy to later on. But also, I'm, what I'm interested in is um, causally relevant and causally irrelevant information. Lots of our cultural practices are irrelevant. It doesn't really matter what we eat at Christmas or what we wear to a wedding, but we have traditions around which, uh, around these types of behaviours that mean that they are propagated, that we do carry them on, they do become traditional identifiers within our cultural community. So when you see um, it, a behaviour being undertaken and some of that is irrelevant or potentially arbitrary, which of these particular types of information are you adopting? Do you adopt the, only the causally relevant or do you also adopt the cause of the irrelevant? I'm interested in model-based biases. Who it is, what are the characteristics of individuals that we are more likely to acquire information from? And I'm going to touch on a few of these today, although there are many, many model-based biases. But the one I'm going to be talking today about gender, about popularity, and, and it came up in the previous last questions around dominance. I'm interested in how we learn the cultural information that we learn. What are the processes? that are occurring. We've talked about a little bit about teaching, we are observing information all the time, how influential is the observation, what about collaboration or interaction or co-production, how much does that <coughs> underpin the way that we learn. And then I'm interested in what it is that you need to see to be able to have a culture that is pro uh, propagated over groups. Do you, you, know, you need to have high fidelity copying. Well actually, do you need high, high fidelity copying? Can you actually see the results that somebody produced with paper aeroplanes and then reverse engineer that without ever actually seeing the process that, that's led to that behaviour? And I'm, I'm, my work very much, I'm not going to be talking about it today, but in the more recent years, over the last two or three years, has very much looked at innovation. Looking at this idea that Nick was bringing up between this interplay between when you have social information presented to you and you have personal information, the trade-off and the, the motivators that mean that you shift between these two things. Um, 
And I'm interested in when, again, this idea of what, what the interplay between social information and individual information, which links in with this, this innovation, when you decide to bring something new to the group, either because you know how to do it personally and the group is not doing it, or because you as a group decide to do something new and create something new. I was told that this audience was incredibly mixed and that you have archaeologists and we have non-academics and we have some psychologists so, and that we had some people interested in creativity and Lego. So I just wanted to give, before we moved on, because I'm talking about innovation now, a little plug to a special issue that I just came out a couple of months ago, which you may be interested in, which kind of brings a lot of the themes that I'm interested in, creativity and innovation, where we've been looking at innovation and creativity across animal species and humans. And cont contributors are ecologists, biologists, psychologists, anthropologists, um, and philosophers, all coming together to talk about novel information and creativity and how that then gets adopted within groups and then spreads. I'm not going to talk about any of this work today, but just want to let you know if you're interested. So, like I said, I'm really going to be giving a very sort of methodological approach where I kind of just say, this is a question I was interested in and this is how we, we did it. So, one of the first diffusion chains that we ran with children and with chimpanzees, um, uh, I did with Vicky Horn and Andy Whiten and Franz de Waal in, in 2005, 2006. And um, we use, in all, nearly all of the studies I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to be talking about what, these kind of funny puzzle boxes, which we touched on this morning, because I'm interested in I'm interested in transmission of all sorts of information, like urban legends and social structures, but these are really easy to use because they give you really clear, observable information. You're not trying to infer what somebody thinks or what they've adopted. They will, you know, if you, you have these boxes that have a reward inside, like a piece of food for a chimpanzee or a sticker for a child, and there are two, at least two methods to get into it, a door that can be lifted or a door that can be slid, you present one of these variants and then you see, does the person who is naive to this task, which of these variants do they choose? Do they copy what they've seen or do they try something new? So it's really that simple, you know, it's just much more observable. We're not trying to infer anything about, about what people have adopted from this. So this is one of the first studies that we, um, we ran and we were interested in finding out whether or not um, chimpanzees or children, uh, we had chains of chimpanzees and chains of children, whether or not they would be able to adopt the kind of behaviours that we were seeding at the beginning of the chains. And the, and the rationale and the motivation for this work came from a paper that was written by Andy and a number of different um, primatologists that were, was looking at wild behaviour within chimpanzee groups within Africa. And what they were finding is that there were a number of different behaviours that appeared to be like cultural behaviours with um, different groups adopting different ways of doing things. And, and there was a suggestion that these different traditions or behaviours that we were seeing within these distinct groups couldn't be explained either genetically or couldn't be explained ecologically, or at least for all of the behaviours that we're seeing. I think there was about 50 different variants. Um, and this was a really quite um, kind, of influ kind of big claim to be making at the time, and, and there was a great deal of scepticism within the primate community, within the people studying primates, not from the chimpanzees <laughs> themselves. I, mean, I don't know what they were thinking, they might have been thinking it wasn't a particularly good reflection on them. But, um, but the, there was a great deal of scepticism for exactly what we were hearing about in the talk, first talk this morning, in that there had been this assumption that what happens is chimpanzees come along, use a tool, throw it away. So if that's the type of behaviour that we're seeing, we're not, why would we then see traditions being built up through observations? Of course, we... And, and, and that it was, you know, there was a question about whether or not really chimpanzees were capable of showing kind of a level of fidelity in the copying of what they'd seen. So what we decided to do was to test this experimentally. So we had these chains of chimpanzees and these chains, and the other thing is we needed to do it with children. We assume children would do this. But there had never been any diffusion chains with children previously, so there was no evidence to show that they would. This. Children might be just, could potentially be just as variable. They might do A, they might do B, they might do something completely different that we never expected. So what we did was um, we presented, um, we trained up models, either children or chimpanzees, in either the lift method or the slide method, and then we ran a diffusion chain in which chimpanzee or a child would watch. Um, either the chimpanzee or child model, so chimpanzees watching chimpanzees and children watching children, and we wanted to see whether or not there was fidelity and faithfulness to the method that we, we had trained the model in, and what we found was that for both 
chimpanzees and for children, we did see fidelity. That if the model had been trained in a lift, then that was um, that was perpetuated across all of the generations down the chain. And if they had been um, um, uh, trained within a slide, then again that was perpetuated, irrespective of whether or not it was children and chimpanzees. This was quite a, a kind of quite. It was a bit of a shift in the field to suggest that they had the cognitive uh, and potential motivation capacity, at least within a lab setting, to be able to show the fidelity across across these kind of small micro generations that we, we have. So this is one of the first things. So then right, we were like, right, we know we can do this with kids. We know that we, we've got a kind of design, a study design that we, we can work with. So then we started to ask some questions, other interesting questions about how information is transmitted. And the next one I'm going to be talking about is this idea about causally relevant and irrelevant. Now, we saw this particular task in the uh, first class, much nicer pictorial representation I have here, I would say, uh, in your talk. But these are two boxes, and they are absolutely identical, except one is clear and one is opaque. So you can see the causal mechanism here, and you can't within the opaque box. And what we do is we get a model who um, comes along, and they, ta they remove these bolts at the top, either by dragging or by poking the bolts out. And then the stick is tapped in the top, in this top hole here. It's all meaningless, all irrelevant actions. And then there's this tube here that has a reward, which is a sticker inside. The tube, uh, the stick can go in. It's on a little bit of Velcro, and so it can, you can pull then pull the reward out. So the only causally relevant action you need to do is to move this door. And you can lift or slide this door, just as you could do with the other box. Now, Andy Whiten and Vicky Horner ran a study with chimpanzees and three-year-old children. And what they found was, was that for chimpanzees, they were very good if they were presented with a clear box or if they were presented with a clear box so that they could then generalise to the opaque box. They left out all of these relevant actions and they just went for the goal. If they were presented with the opaque box first, they tended to copy the irrelevant actions because they didn't understand the causal access. They didn't have access to the causality within the box. However, when it was three-year-old children, they just tended to copy everything. And there's been this argument that this is maybe one of the things that underpins our cultural transmission. This ability that we have to, to want to replicate things even when they seem to be causally irrelevant. Because we have these cultural activities which don't appear to have any relevance, or they're not, they're not causally necessary, but they are culturally ne necessary. So it might be one of the things that underpin this. So the sample that Vicky used within this study with the three-year-old children was rather small. And so we replicated this with Nicola McGuigan in dyadic studies where we presented, we had tested three-year-olds and five-year-olds and we had a live condition and a video condition with a model adult, adult demonstrator. And what we're seeing is with the five-year-olds, they were copying everything, irrespective of whether it was live or video and irrespective of whether it was the clear box or the opaque box. Three-year-olds, again, in the live condition were copying everything. In the video condition, they didn't so much. So we seem to see, apart from, we, we think the inter we, interpreted, we interpreted this as being three-year-olds' difficulty <coughs> in trying to transfer what they were learning on a video condition, a 2D display, over to a 3D task. We thought that that was the difficulty that they were having, rather than being more clever and thinking, I don't need to do this, I'm not going to do it. It was something about the translation. We've run lots and lots and lots of over-imitation studies. Uh, looking at different models and, every, uh, and, uh, and different parameters around how we present the irrelevant information. And what we see, not, you know, there, there are parameters around when you do, but on the whole, children tend to over-imitate quite a lot. So what I was interested in looking at is whether or not children would over-imitate when they were learning from other children. So children are surrounded by other children a lot of the time in schools, even in, uh, in other uh, communities and other cultures where um, they, they, they tend to congregate with other children and to learn information from other children. So is it the case that they will also see other children in the same way that they see these adult models and that they will over-imitate um, um, from, uh, from their peers as well as over-imitating from live or video models? So what we did, what I did, was I took these tasks and I ran a diffusion chain with these particular tasks to see whether or not children would be copying the, the um, irrelevant actions. So if they do remove the redundant actions, I wanted to know, is this a gradual removal where there's about five different irrelevant actions? Do they take away one at each generation? So it's kind of like maybe a memory issue, or they're kind of not certain, so they don't want to do too much, so they, they just talk of 
just take one away? Or do they just go, that's a load of nonsense, we're not going to do that, I'm going to parse out the whole thing completely because it's completely irrelevant. We don't need to do that. I was interested in looking at developmental effects between twos and three-year-olds, and of course I ran the chains with either the opaque box or the transparent box. And so what we did, we run these chains, but we also run at each point a no-model control condition where as Nick was saying, what you want to do is say, well, what do they just do naturally with this box? Maybe they naturally come along and tap, along, tap in the top. They don't, by the way. That's just a kind of redundant action that we've put in. But we need to be sure that it isn't something that they would do naturally when simply presented with the task. I'm going to have lots of, lots of diagrams like this. I'm a bit like this. So each of these is a chain of individuals. You have your two-year-olds and your three-year-olds. Two-year-olds this side, three-year-olds this side. This is your opaque box and this is your tra and transparent box. And what we see is that actually, um, when we look at the last generation in each of the chains, we are seeing that they have parsed out. They are not over-imitating. They are not copying these irrelevant actions. And in fact, they're doing this relatively quickly. We do see interesting innovations come in. So most of these are kind of just, you know, slide the door, retrieve the reward, slide the door, retrieve the reward. Um, um, but this one, what they decided to do was to slide the door about 20 times, and then somebody else slides the door about 20 times. So we are seeing kind of variants coming in. Rarely, this is only one chain, everybody else has gone, these are all rubbish ideas, we're not doing, we're not rubbish actors, we're not going to do that. But we do see behaviours coming in. So what we could take away from that study was that both two and three year olds were quick at passing out these irrelevant actions. It wasn't a gradual process, it was happening very early. With tapping not being transmitted beyond the second generation, beyond the second child within the train. But even though children passed out these irrelevant actions, they were faithful. There was a tradition that was established with whether or not the door was lifted or the door was slid. If they saw a receded door slide, they stuck with that. It's arbitrary whether or not you lift or slide the door, but there is a tradition down these chains. So it's not that they are completely and utterly that we don't care about culture, we don't care what, they, what you're doing, they do, but they only care about it around causally relevant actions, and these irrelevant actions are just a bit of nonsense. So we see canalisation, we see conformity, we see kind of cultural transmission, but only for relevant actions. <laughs> and so we began to reflect on this, so Rachel and me and Jill Vale, one of our PhD students, Lewis Dean and, and, and um, Kevin Nayland, and we began to say, well, this is like a kind of form of cumulative culture. Now, cumulative culture is normally seen as, I, I have this thing and I make it better by adding this other thing to it, and then we add this other thing and then it gets better. But actually, if you think about things like computers and phone development, but um, these objects and these technologies are also getting better by being faster, being smaller, and being more efficient. So we were saying that children, uh, I was saying that, uh, um, and in this paper we argue, that maybe cumulative culture can be seen in two different ways. One of um, elaboration, uh, but efficient elaboration, and one of kind of efficiency due to reducing some of the things that need to be done. It just be, it's more efficient by t through time or through cost of effort. Um, so then I wanted to talk about a study which um, looked at model-based biases and whether or not that affects transmissions. I'm going to tell you about the study that I've run today is my least favourite study I've ever undertaken and the results are my least favourite. I know we should be, we scientists, we should be very dispassionate about our work but I'm going to be very honest that uh, it's a great study, great design, just kind of, you'll find out why at the end. Um, so there was a, um, I'm, you know, I'm interested in trying to make these links between what we're seeing in the primate societies and whether or not we can see um, um, uh, kind of parallels within, within human children and within human societies. And this study had been published by Lonsdorf looking at different chimpanzees' learning styles. I don't know if any of you know this one, but um, it, it was that m males of termite fishing, how do they learn about termite fishing? Males tend to do a lot more trial and error learning um, about uh, and finding out the affordances of sticks for themselves. Females spend a lot more time observing uh, around their parents, and that normally their mother termite fishing, and, uh, and, and learn that way. They do trial and error as well, but they spend more time learning and observing through observation, whereas males are more likely to do hands-on trial and error. So we thought, well, is this true of humans? If this is true of humans, what we should see is we should see males doing better within uh, the no model condition in which they're not observing, and we should see females doing better 
within the social learning diffusion chain because that's their opportunity to learn from others and then to implement what they've learned. So the task that we used was this um, extraction tool use task, which is meant to be a little bit like termite fishing. And there were two different tools and two different methods, or we thought there was only two different methods. <laughs> um, that's not the reason why I don't like the study. In fact, I love it when they find new things that we didn't know. Uh, there's a spindle at the top that you can turn. It opens this door. You have this stabbing tool. Inside is a number of like a polystyrene beads, like you get in packaging material. And so you can stab the tool in, and it's like a little watsit, and you can take out these beads at the end of the fork, just like here. And then what you have at the side of the box, you have a door that can be lifted. It's a very thin, like, ruler-like tool, and that can be inserted, and then you can use that to guide these watsits out through this chute here. So there are two different methods and two different tools. And we had a number of children who we uh, put into diffusion chains and in their model controls. We had three, we were testing three-year-olds and five-year-olds, and our chains were made up of only chains of females or only chains of males. So three-year-olds and five-year-olds, females and males, and they were either seeded with the stab or the slide method, and there were two chains for each, each particular condition, and uh, I think there were five generations in each chain. One of the things I do want to let you know is, when we're doing these chains, what we don't do is the model, we train the model up to do something and then we bring the other child in and we sit them down at a point where they have a view of what's going on. We say nothing about teaching, showing, do it like this, copying, imitating. They are simply in the presence of this behaviour happening. They are simply observational. There are no cues from us as experimenters about the fact that there is meant to be a transmission. They are simply seeing somebody else do something and then we want to know. So they are fully, absolutely within their right when they do this to pick up the other tool and try something new. And when that happens, we don't give any cues like, oh, this is really exciting. We don't give any cues about, no, you're not meant to do it like that. It's completely free. The children are completely free in terms of how they interact with the task. So again, another, <coughs> another kind of diagram again, uh, pokes, poke chains, slide chains, three-year-old females, three-year-old males, five-year-old females, five-year-old males, and black is when they successfully, a block colour is when they've successfully extracted rewards from the task, and when it's hashed it means they've attempted something but they haven't managed to do it. And then you occasionally get offshoots because children come in and they just don't do anything meaningful on the task. They literally just stand next to it and just look at you in a slightly fearful way. <laughs> and then we can't then use them as models. We don't mind, we can use individuals as models if they have done something like meaningful on the task, like picking up the tools or trying to do something with the box, irrespective of what it is. But we can't, if they just stand there, and not having demonstrated that they know anything about the task, then use them as a model. So what you'll see is that we do again see fidelity in the types of tools that were being used. So we have 80 children here, and only one of these children, a three-year-old female, is trying something new. In one of her first attempts, she picks up the other tool, which is the poke tool, and attempts to use that. She doesn't succeed with using it, then she puts it down and she goes back to the slide tool, which she'd just seen the previous child using. This is one out of 80. So what we could see, we have this interesting mixture of fidelity and lack of fidelity. So we see fidelity in that there's virtually no crossover between the methods that we're seeing being, um, being used, except for the individual that I like to call Little Miss Innovator, who tried something and it didn't work and then went back to what the group had done. So she disregarded potential personal information. Um, the chains are more successful than the no model control condition. If you see, unsurprisingly, if you see somebody do something on the task and they're successful, you are then good at the task rather than simply being presented with the task. One of the techniques is completely absent from the no model control condition. If the children in that condition were successful, they were successful by stabbing, using the stabbing poking tool, not by the slide. But if you saw slide, then you used the slide tool. And the no model control condition even invented a new method. That's right, they stuck the slide tool in the top and flipped out the, the what kind of thing. Very clever. I love it when they do this. You're kind of like, you know, you're trying to be very, very... You, you look at the videos afterwards and you get very excited then. But we also see a lack of fidelity in that only nine of the 16 chains actually have the full five generations. There are deviations that are occurring. And we did, and this is why I don't like the data, although I'm very, you know, dispassionate about it. 
is that we do see boys actually being better social learners than girls. They were less likely to drop out from the chains by being unwilling to participate in the task. And we gave a graded system of how much they interacted with the task from picking up a tool, to, or touching the box, picking up a tool, opening a door, inserting a tool, whichever tool it was, whichever door it was, um, attempting to get these things out, and then successfully getting these things out. And what the boys were, the boys were better at uh, being, uh, they got higher scores along that grading system. So I don't think it's better that they are actually better at social learning. They were better, had higher scores there. They just seem to be more physically adept and more confident at trying to, yeah. in, uh, under the social learning condition, there was no difference in the, uh, in the no model control condition. Both boys and girls were just as good at the task then. But in the social learning condition, where there's a lot of social pressure, we're talking about other parameters that you might bring in, girls seem to not perform as much. You seem to get this sort of gender-based drop in performance. And unsurprisingly, five-year-olds were more successful than three-year-olds. So we looked at one characteristic of gender and whether or not that influenced how you learn uh, down diffusion chains. And, and what we wanted to do was diffusion chains are brilliant because they allow you to control as masses of stuff. You can have chains of girls and chains of boys. You can have chains of three-year-olds and chains of five-year-olds. You have chains of chimpanzees and chains of children. So you can really control, and you can control which order they come in, and you can control what they see and what they witness. But the real world isn't like that. The real world is much, much more complex than that. We know this. So what we decided to do was to go, OK, let's try something new. Let's see how information is spread and whether or not we can have microcultures produced when we run open diffusion chains. Now, this is the closed group that we were hearing about in the first talk. We call them open diffusion as opposed to closed group diffusion. But because children are free to come and go as they wish to, and they're all present at when this task is being used. Now, with this particular task, we use the pan pipes. And um, these are two hollow tubes that once one sits on another. And there's a reward that sits on this upper tube, uh, but there's this block that stops the reward falling forward. And this block can be removed in two different ways. It can be lifted with this stick. There's a T-bar on the top, and you could hook it under and lift it. And then the reward falls out and falls down this front door. So you can't see that very well there. There's a front door. Or you can push it back, in which it rolls back, falls to this lower tube, and comes out exactly the same door. Mm -hmm. These are the two methods that we invented, that we said, oh, isn't this good? We have a lift method, we've got a uh, we've got a poke method, and then the kids came along and discovered the T-bar method, which is where you use the tool to push the T-bar back. So it's a pushing back, but it's not through the enclosure, not through this flappy door at the bottom. So, you know, they are inventing around what we are presenting to them. Um, so we have these two different methods that we thought were only two different methods, method A and method B, the lift and the poke. And we ran a diffusion, and what we did is we uh, recruited real playgroups, playgroups of children where the children go every day, have sets of friends, know where the toilets are, know where the snack time is, know where the reading corner is. They know this environment really well. This is their environment. And we are coming to their environment. These are children who have interacted with each other for, for, for months, if not years. And we luckily, because these are real play groups, we matched our three groups uh, by age and by uh, verbal, uh, verbal, uh, verbal ability, <coughs> which is a proxy that we use for intelligence. So there was no difference in these groups and their makeups make in terms of they were similar sorts of ages of the children within each of these groups, and they were similar sorts of intelligence. So you know we had pretty good, luckily, pretty good matched groups. And what we did is we split, we had these three groups and we seeded in one of the groups the poke method, and I'll explain why, uh, how we did that after uh, in a minute. Then we um, seeded the lift method in the other group, and then with the other nursery, we then um, had um, no model control conditions where we simply presented the task and said, what will the children do with this task? How successful are they? are they? And what we wanted to do was, after having seeded these, these methods in the group, we wanted to see what's the sequence of the children's discoveries, who is, who is learning from whom, are we seeing the adoption of the method that we've seeded in, or are they all doing lots and lots of different things? Do we have two very different groups, with one group being the lift group and one group being the poke group? Do we see subcultures within one group, where there's a group of children who are the lifters and a group of children who are the pokers? 
are they all mixed up? You know, so what's the sequence of discovery? How, what are the methods? And do methods change? Who are the innovators? How much innovation do we see? And what are the mechanisms of the transmission and adoption of these particular behaviours? So are they observing? Are they teaching? Are they collaborating? So the way that we see the, these behaviours in is we took two, uh, a female from each of the groups, each of the poke group or the lift group, and we trained that female, we profiled all of the children and, and we picked a child who was high in popularity, so they would attract other children, and high in dominance, so they could actually get to the task before children discovered something. You know, we have to seed it first of all before we can sort of just let, let it all run free. We didn't want another child to come in and take over and do something completely different uh, for, at the initial testing. Um, and they had to be in full, full attendance over, over that week. And we trained those children up to be re a, a really great lifter and a really great poker. And that's all we did. We didn't mm -hmm. talk to them about teaching your friends. We didn't talk to them about being special in the group, anything like that. They simply had, within their behavioural <coughs> repertoire, the ability to lift or the ability to poke. We presented the task into the group for one hour every day when all of the children were around. So it wasn't during snack time where some children were being made to sit down. Everybody was free to come and have a go. And the kind of questions we had were, will separate microcultures be produced across the playgroups, but potentially within the playgroups? What are the processes? Teaching negotiation, uh, introduction, come and have a go at this, it's really interesting. Observation. And what about innovation? If we do see change in these behaviours, you know, how does that happen? And what are the predictors of social learning and innovation? So this is what we were able to do. We were able to track the behaviour. And so across, these are children across the top. And this is the order in which they attempted the task. And this is the model. And actually the model doesn't start the task off. What she does is she, she calls another child over and she spontaneously taught that child, talk, talk, talked that child through the steps of what they had to do. And then we can track which of the children is watching, what their history is before they first have an attempt. So a child here might have seen a number of failed attempts, they might have seen a number of successes, who are they watching, what have they learned from. So we did it over five days and we had 58 children when we collapsed both, um, both experimental groups and 48 of them were participating on the task. Ten of the children are not interested in this task at all, we want to go off and read books in the quiet corner, we don't want to do whatever you're doing, but the majority of children are motivated to come along. We had 1,322 turns or bouts of attempts, and um, from this, if somebody was talking about, um, I can't remember who, about some of the tasks that we use are really easy. And actually, this is easy once you've mastered it, but difficult to sometimes master first of all. So actually, we only had 318 successes of all of these different turns. So the children are finding this task really motivating, and, and it's not so easy that it's not something they want to engage with. And what we found when we looked at the tracking of the behaviour across these groups is that we did see different microcultures being produced. It wasn't that the children were just doing whatever they wanted willy-nilly. Um, children matched their behaviour to what they'd seen most, which goes back to whether that was the seeded behaviour or whether or not when a new variant of behaviour came in, if that was the main behaviour that they had seen most often, then that's what they copied. Um, there were many forms of transmission, but the most common was, one was observational learning. Children were watching other children do these types of behaviour uh, uh, a, a lot. Um, and most children who had an attempt had the mean or the average was 44. They'd seen 44 attempts or turns previously. And this ranged from not seeing any previously, just having a go yourself, or having 179 was the, the child who had the most observations. We did see elements of stimulus enhancement, children watching, knowing something interesting was going on over there, going over there, and then trying something completely new. And we did also see some forms of teaching. So of these 1,322 1, turns, 48, only 48, so it's not a main, main process, it's not the most common process, was accompanied with some form of verbal instructions. But what was interesting was that in both groups, both of the models didn't have the first attempt, but talked through and taught <coughs> other members of the group how to do it. So it seems to be a critical feature about kicking this off <coughs> rather than maintaining it. Um, it, it, it might not be uh, the thing that, that we need to do. However, what we did see with the teaching, sorry, as an aside, um, we did see children, what I could be called sort of over-teaching. So a child would have a go at the task, be successful, and then another child who is sitting, standing next to them would then talk them through 
exactly what they've just seen them done. So they are they're teaching them, but they're not really teaching them in the strictest form of it because that child has just demonstrated that they have this knowledge. This child B, who is providing the verbal instruction, is not giving them any new information. This is not teaching as we see teaching to be. But it may be that, one, that what we do see with this kind of behaviour is a kind of policing, a kind of we do it by poking, and or it, whether it's an intentional policing or whether or not it's just a byproduct that this conformity is a byproduct of this this verbal kind of conformity or you know or instruction which is providing further input that this is how we do it and this is what we're going to do. So we di um, and we did see um, we saw si 64 instances of children using new methods. Now sometimes this was because it was their first attempt and they'd never done it previously. But 22 of them were because they changed the method. It wasn't that every when we seeded lift it only remained lift, and when we seeded poke it only remained as poke. We saw that these new attempts were learned a lot through observation. Sometimes through instruction alone, because these two models were coming in and giving instructions first of all. Sometimes a combination of observation and instruction that people would talk other children through. Sometimes they did teach them. They did, you know, they did provide verbal <coughs> instructions when they needed them. Um, but we also saw that there was individual learning or kind of new variants being discovered by individuals because they hadn't seen any other variants or because they were changing and discovering new variants within the task on 17% of the, of the time. And this is similar to the success rate that we're seeing in the known model control condition. When we simply present it to the children with this particular task, they are, they are succeeding and successful on this task 18% of the time. We did see group adaptations though. So we seeded a particular method, we seeded the poke, it turned into the T-bar method in which the children were attempting to, to, to push the T-bar with not all children, but a significant number of children adopting that. And we saw um, the lift method turning into the poke method. If we'd have carried on for another week, would we have seen the poke method in this group turn into the T-bar method? I don't know. But it, it, we, uh, we were seeing processes of introduction of new variants and adoption of those new variants and changes within the groups. And so one of the things that we wanted to do with this kind of work is to ask the question of whether or not how much these microcultures map onto real cultures, the cultures that we live within. And there's a great deal of work within cultural evolution <laughs> in which, um, which is suggesting that the way that cultures evolve and change over time is this mixture between fidelity and innovation, that we need to have the majority of individuals being faithful to what we do as social norms, what we do as traditions and cultural practices, and then variants coming in occasionally, which then, because they are better for whatever reason, whether they're faster or they're more elaborate, or are more efficient, then we will adopt those. But we, we can't have it with too many new, new variants coming in because it's just too confusing for us and we don't have stability in the way that we interact with others. And what we're seeing is what, what we saw within the playgroups that we were looking at is exactly that kind of model. A lot of observational learning with a few variants slipping in and those variants occasionally being adopted and then transmitted within the groups. We also, going back to the idea that, you know, the world is a very <coughs> complex situation and there are lots of things that might predict how information spreads across groups, we profiled all of the children within our groups to find out whether or not we could see what the predictors were. We looked at biographic data around age, gender, because we found these interesting findings before, number of siblings in developmental psychology, we see a number of cognitive processes being influenced by the number of siblings, the age of those siblings and the gender of those siblings. So do we see this around cultural adoption? Perhaps <coughs> if you have lots and lots of older children, you have lots and lots of input and variants coming into you, so you're much more quicker at potentially innovating, maybe you're a better cultural learner because you've had lots of practice around that. We're interested in the social dynamics of the group, we measured popularity, dominance, and friendship affili affiliations. What was the social network within the group? And also cognitive processes. I'm interested in children because they provide us with a, with a kind of um, a lesser enculturated individuals than adults. But we also, they cognitively are, co you know, there are new skills that are coming online all the time as they develop. So how do they cultural adoption change as these different behaviours improve or come online. So we were interested in things like inhibitory control. Can you inhibit your, your desire <coughs> to do it in a certain way to then be able to try another variant or are you just absolutely only want the reward really quickly? 
theory of mind, the ability to reflect on the mental states of others and the knowledge that they may have, your ability to imitate how good an imitator you are, as well as your verbal ability, <coughs> which is what we use as a proxy for intelligence. We also looked at temperament as well. Some children are shy, some children um, get very frustrated, some children take a great deal of pleasure by interacting with difficult tasks, some children don't. Some children you know, are happy and joyful, some children are less happy and joyful. <laughs> so, I like that you know the happy and joyful ones. Um, so, how is it that these kind of temperamental, potentially personality effects may influence how information is spread? Well, we looked at the predictors and to see if we could see whether or not there was um, a predictor that could be made about how information was uh, adopted and, 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 and spread. We saw that age was one of the, well, the critical ones. Unsurprisingly, older children, because they're more physically adept, were, had more successes. They were watched more by others, and we see this <laughs> within a lot of literature, that adults and older individuals tend to be the reference for cultural information. In over-imitation work, you will over-imitate if an adult presents this information to you. You will copy these irrelevant actions. If a child presents them to you, you won't copy them as successfully. They're, it's context dependent, but we're seeing a lot of that kind of, uh, of, of result coming out from what we do. You also watch others more. You, you realise that the world is an interesting place and that you, are more like, you, you will gain a lot of information by, by observing others. But each, interesting as well, they are more faithful to the seeded method. So maybe there is something about this being seeded, this being what happens first, and this being the cultural norm and not wishing to deviate from that. Whereas these young bucks come along and try to do something new and different. And we see this within the animal literature, the necessities and mother of innovation. If you're less dominant, you, are, um, you have to be more innovative because sometimes you're not going to get to the food if you don't try to do something a bit clever that other people aren't thinking about because you, you're, you're last in the, in the row of, of trying to get what you need and, and try to get the food. We also saw um, that popularity was one of the predictors of how the information transmits. Popularity, children was more su popular children were more successful, but it wasn't simply that they get, were given access. They didn't kind of waltz up and say, I am, um, you know, I now want a turn, and everybody just, you know, stepped away and said, yeah, we really like you. Th there were long episodes where the box was free for anybody to use, and so there was lots of opportunity for individuals to come in and to be able to use it. They were watched more, but they also watched others more. So maybe there's something about when you're popular, you are learning a lot from individuals and taking a lot of information about many different aspects of your environment, whether it be the social relations of individuals or the physical behaviours and the opportunities that there are within, within the environment within which you're living. So you want to explore your environment more. These are all just suppositions, but yeah. Uh, do you have some estimates of how... Uh, good these predictors are? I do in my paper, but not to hand. So, yeah, so this was a regression in which you could see the yeah. power that was coming in into each of these. But I think age is, age is definitely the strongest predictor, and, um, and then popularity is coming after that. We then saw shyness and unsurprisingly, shyness and confidence in terms of temperament. Confident children were more likely to attempt the task first, whereas shy children held back. That's not really that much of a surprise. But we also saw a predictor around friendship patterns. <coughs> children were twice as likely to watch their friends as they were to watch children that they didn't like. Now, we don't know whether or not this is because you have a bias to learn from your friends, you want to learn from your friends, or whether or not it's simply you hang around with your friends, so you and your friend group go to the task as a friend group, so you have more opportunity to learn from your friends as opposed to it being a drive to you. I mean, this is a, a question that many people could with a nice two by two experimental lab study. Um, and then I just wanted to end very quickly on a study that kind of taps into some of the stuff that Nick was talking about, about the interplay between social information and individual information and how we use that. And it's very different, I think, to, well, maybe not so different, the kind of information, the kind of findings. Actually, there is some parallels. Now, it's a very complex task. This is a puzzle box that has a wheel inside and, it's, and I, can, I can control it with, remote con with a remote control. So it has a wheel inside with a number of different rewards sitting underneath it and this can be spun as I, when I press a button so I don't need to be there present to be rebating this particular box. And the way that you get the rewards <coughs> is you press a lever, you turn a dial and then you push the door up. So it's leave, uh, so it, you, and, and there are two methods and both of them involve 
turning a dial and pressing a lever, they alternate as to which you need to do first. So you push a lever and then turn a dial and then open the door, or you turn the dial, press a lever and then open the door. There are a number of distractors on this as well. We wanted there are buttons that you can press where lights. We wanted to have a look at the copying of irrelevant actions as well as the copying of relevant actions. And what we did is we had two phases. We had 22 children. It was very much a sort of small pilot study, but I think it's quite interesting about this interface. In this initial asocial phase, we simply presented an individual child with the box and said, you know, lots of boys and girls have had a go and now it's your turn. And we didn't say anything more than that. And we looked at their exploration and whether or not they discovered one of these methods. And we had 22 children and half of the children did discover a method. And that was reasonably evenly 6-4 split over method A or method B. So uh, six children discovered method A, doesn't matter what it was. And, and four children discovered method B. But that's pretty much sort of, it's not 50-50, but it's virtually 50-50. So we're not seeing one of these methods being, you know, a, a, a better method than the other method. And then what we did is we presented a social phase. So the same group of children, we presented the task into the nursery again for an hour, an hour and a half every day. I think, I think it was just for two days. And we then looked at who interacted and which methods they then used. Now we saw 91 successful extractions, 30 of them were from method A and then 60 of them were from method B. And what we saw is, so at the top, these are the children in the order in which they attempted the task. If they have a box around them at the top, this is their performance in the individual um, learning phase. So the ones who are like white are the method A and the ones that are grey are the method B. And what we find is, when we present it into the group, children are discovering new things. And we're seeing different variants being performed. We're seeing different children. Some children are performing method A, some children method B. Then day two, everybody does method B. So they are conforming onto some kind of canalisation of behaviour into some kind of, of social, of, of normative behaviour around that group. Nobody... Uh, you know, we're not telling them that they have to. We can tell they can do whatever they like with the box. But what we are seeing is that they are naturally, it's only a few children, they are giving, these are children who were individual learners of the other method, and they are adopting this and consistently using it. So while children enter a setting with a variety of methods at their disposal, what we're seeing is that they converge on what is an arbitrary norm. norm. It doesn't really matter whether they use method A or method B. They're just as, just as um, effective at extracting the reward. So I wanted to, to, to finish, because I was really wanted to just give a methodology kind of talk about how you can use these sorts of, 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 of methods to address this, you know, some of the questions you may be interested in, and I'm doing that by reflecting on the questions that I'm interested in. The diffusion studies are really useful because you, you can use them across species. The way that we do it is they're very non-verbal. You simply present it in, and you kind of present a signal which says, here you go, but you know, you're not providing much more than that. You can use them with really, really young children because they are non-verbal. You can use different tasks. So I've used, I presented Puddle Box today, but as I said, I've been looking at urban legends. You can use them with artificial languages. Um, you can look at them with friendship affiliations or social... I think there are some people who are doing some work on looking at diffusion of more social, abstract entities. Um, it doesn't matter what your theoretical stance is, it doesn't matter whether you're coming from an associative perspective or whether or not you're thinking, you're thinking about higher order processes, because actually they're allowing you to explore some of these questions, it doesn't really matter. Um, and then you can present them within the lab, within a school, within a zoo, within the wild, they're, they're not context kind of dependent as well. Then theoretically the kind of <coughs> things that I have um, come away from my work finding out that I didn't know before, with the apes or primates, uh, chimpanzee or human primates, can transmit arbitrary behaviours across groups. Young children also <coughs> seem to arbitrary behaviour that they are shown by others. However, they will demonstrate cumulative culture when learning from their peers because they will make inefficient behaviours more efficient. They also disregard, in some cases, their own personal behaviour to fit in with the group. However, Rachel and I, with our PhD student, Mara Wood, have run a study that's shown that, that actually that's not always the case. That actually, if you have them in a in a dyadic setting with a task, they are they explore a great deal and will, will discover a number of new methods. 
<coughs> we see predict predictors of social transmission in groups related to age, popularity, dominance, friendship, affiliation, shyness, and com confidence. I'm sure they are not exhaustive <coughs> of all the processes. But I think what came, what was interesting to us most of all about that particular open diffusion work was that mm. it's not the cognitive processes that are predicting these particular, it's not how clever you are or how verbal you are or whether or not you've got good inhibitory control skills. On the whole, it's your social network and your social affiliations and, and uh, which is predicting how this information is. is <coughs> Innovation tends to be rare, but it's crucial to cultural evolution. You need to have individuals who are bringing new variants into a group for those variants to be adopted. So I just want to finish by thanking the two main collaborators that I've talked about their work today. Um, um, and Nicola McGuigan and Andy White, and obviously all the schools and the children and the adults who participated, as well as all the, uh, the funders as well. And just want to say thank you very much.